Thank you very much for that, Professor Burke. You've left us with a lot to think about, and I think it also leads us perfectly into the next talk. Again, I'll give a very short personal introduction. I left you in a moment of my own biography as somebody who had finished my BA studies and decided that I want to research further history of popular culture and discovered an interest in folklore. But I also believe that speaking about these things too generally misses the point. We can speak about memory even in comparative perspective, but in the end, if you really, really want to get to a meaningful observations, we need to take a case study and investigate it in depth. And Professor Burke has guided us, in fact, one of the countries that has, as he defined, an excess of memory is Ireland. And so I developed an interest in Ireland and in Irish folklore. Before I even became interested in memory, it was Irish folklore, it was Irish popular culture. And so once again, I did what people did back then. Instead of opening Google, because we didn't use the internet quite that way then, I went to the library and looked for the best book that Tel Aviv University had to offer on Irish history. And that's where I encountered a book called Modern Ireland, 1600 till 1972 by R.F. Foster. I remember taking that book, thinking I knew something about Ireland, realizing I knew very little, but something out of general knowledge, and reading it from cover to cover, and then reading it again, and realizing that everything that I had thought was not what I had thought. It was not a simple story. In fact, it begins with varieties of Irishness. It's, it's a complicated story. Exactly this notion of multiple perspectives all the time. It's never what it seems. It's always complicated. It's never a simple narrative. It's been abused and used by other people. We have to question the narratives that we're presented. And in fact, as Professor Foster writes in another article, which I read years later, the very notion of national history, a simplistic history, is itself a folklore construction. It follows folklore motifs. It follows the very steps, as Professor Foster once showed, very amusingly, at least for me, follows the structures of Vladimir Propp's stages of folklore. <laughs> Irish history's stage is a folklore story. With that in mind, I became increasingly interested in Irish history, and yet I wanted to look at a case study, at a case, where I could come to terms with this notion of from folklore to folk history, from folk history to folk memory. What do I mean by memory? And then I read a text, just when I arrived in Ireland. In fact, I heard it presented first, and then I read a text um, entitled Remembering 1798. Professor Foster took to task the whole establishment of Irish historians. He looked at an event as it was being commemorated 200 years later, returned to the event, jumped 100 years forward to how it was commemorated a centenary later. I'm thinking of Professor Burke's comment of losing the war and then winning it in, as the centenary, and then jumped 200 years later seeing these different layers of memory and how they're manipulated and co-opted by different people and abused. From that moment on again, I knew what I had to research. I had the case that needed to be studied. The agenda was there. Even the conclusions were almost there. I had to work out the details. Everything was already presented there. And as indeed, Ireland presents us with a history which has these multiple voices, these multiple perspectives. It is a country which people in Israel can understand sometimes because quote the great poet, William Butler Yeats, is a country of great, of, of great hatred, little room. Little room, great hatred. And we can understand this condensity. And I quote Yeats on purpose because, of course, Professor Foster is the finest biographer of Yeats. He's written the prize-winning ultimate, in my opinion, biography of Yeats. And it was with, with this that Professor Foster was invited to look, to focus on one place, on Ireland, and to look at animosities in Irish memory. But then he told me, just, just before we came here, that he has a new title for his paper. But he didn't tell me the title, so I'm in suspense. I'll invite you to present it yourself. Thank you, Professor Foster. Thank you, Guy. Your, your Excellency, Rector, friends, it is a great honour and pleasure to be here after so many years and um, to be invited here by Guy, whom I'm going to contradict at once because we are here to honour an extraordinary book which he has just published. And one of the ways I want to honour him is by changing my title. This, the title you may have on your outline can stand as a subtitle, History, Memory and Antagonism in Ireland. But it now has a lead title, which is Students of, you, students of guys may know his taste for films, the more obscure the better. So I've chosen a rather cinematic title. The Buried to Tombstone, 
the melting iceberg and the random bullet history, memory and antagonism in Ireland. I taught in Oxford for 25 years and two of the happiest and most stimulating of them were 2012 to 2014 when we had Guy Biner with us as a visiting Marie Curie fellow. He made us laugh, he queried what we thought, he made connections which are now called transnational and certainly transcultural connections which we would never have thought of and it was a joy to have him with us. He gave us insights into Irish history which I still treasure and his new book has done the same. It has made us see what we understand by memory, by forgetting and by antagonism. And the relationship between the depth and intensity of historic hatreds and the necessity for oblivion, which as Peter Burke has just shown us, is one reason why civil wars are the most deeply and problematically covered over. Hence the first clause in my new title, The Tombstone, because Guy in his book gives a marvellous account of a buried rebel from 1798 who has his tombstone engraved and buried with him. He is remembered, but remembered, so to speak, underground, engraved in stone, and like so many stones, it works its way up to the surface. The second metaphor in my title comes from an Ulster reference, not in Guy's book, but I suspect he will like it. It is the project by the Ulster artist Rita Duffy to tow an iceberg from the Arctic Circle to Belfast, to moor it by the Titanic Centre, where that doomed ship was built, and then to let it slowly melt into oblivion. She hasn't succeeded in getting all the backing she needs for this yet, but I very much hope she will. So burial of memory and melting into forgetfulness are sometimes a necessary condition for coexistence where there has been a history of hatred. And that raises the question of why and how a people can hate each other. The great lexicographer Samuel Johnson, who was a good hater, um, remarked once that unlike the Scots, whom he famously disliked, he liked the Irish. He said, Unlike the Scots, the Irish are not in a conspiracy to cheat the world by false representations of the merits of their countrymen. No, sir, the Irish are a very fair people. They never speak well of one another. <laughs> His prejudices on the subject might lead us to expect him to go on to, as my children would say, diss the Irish. But no, he, he, he favoured them greatly. He believed they were an ancient and illustrious people. And above all, Johnson believed that the record of history showed how badly the Irish had been treated by the English. Not a common perception among Tories in the 18th century. He didn't go on to say that perhaps that was why the Irish abused each other so much. But if you take a psychoanalytical view of Irish history, you might be tempted to think that this deferred reaction is indeed the reason for the depth and the violence of Irish mutual antipathies, man handing on misery to man, deepening like a coastal shelf. And fashions in history writing are indeed shifting towards the psychological. This has led, as Guy and Peter Burke and others have shown us, to history being approached and interpreted as social memory. Memory has come to be the way we interrogate history, leading to a preoccupation with those obscure operations of memory, rather than a dogged attempt to establish supposedly ascertainable facts. If you're to return to a rather psychoanalytical view, if you're a classicist, you may remember that Cleo, the muse of history, is one of the many daughters of memory, Menemnosne. Now, in, so to speak, the mother has supplanted the daughter. Memory is, in a way, the daughter of history. And not the least achievement of Guy's book is the way that he excavates the various versions of the facts and shows how they are stirred and blended into memory and sometimes oblivion. Towards the end of his book, he instances the refusal of a scholar to give evidence at the trial of Maurice Papon for crimes committed under Vichy on the grounds that the process was adding to the confusion between history and memory, a very striking instance. And as the search to reimagine experience takes over, so does the exploration of feeling and sensibility, which has been a characteristic of the decade of commemorating the Irish Revolution of we now think 1912 to 1922, currently affecting Irish life. In particular, this has led to a concentration, and here I come back in a sense to Peter's conclusion, 
a concentration on the plurality of experience, and that's a very valuable emphasis. But to anyone who reads Irish history, and indeed any Irish historian, has to be struck by the vehemence with which mutual animosity has been invoked, declared, and acted upon in Ireland. It's not just that vituperation comes easily and eloquently to Irish tongues, it's the extent to which violent antipathies are acted upon. And I'd like to remember in this symposium the non-reconciliatory aspects of Irish history where forgetfulness is perhaps most essential. Having successfully commemorated the anniversaries of the Third Home Rule Bill, the start of World War I, above all the Easter Rising of 1916, that fateful date which Peter mentioned, Ireland is now headed into remembering more disruptive events between the Irish peoples from the revolutionary decade. That is, the Anglo-Irish War, the treaty which was so bitterly argued about, and finally the Civil War, which ended that decade. And it may be less easy to recognize and appreciate a plurality of views and identifications there. I want also to consider the extent to which the aftermath of a colonized history necessarily involves centuries of simmering antagonism that will inevitably have to break out. Much as Freud, who keeps recurring, posited in his theory of the return of the repressed, whereby suppressed impulses fester in the unconscious to return inevitably, though not always recognizably, to produce symptomatic outbursts compounding chaos and violence. Here again I might invoke Dr. Johnson speaking about the penal laws enacted against Catholics in the 18th century. He wrote, the Irish are in a most unnatural state for we see there the minority prevailing over the majority. There is no instance of such severity as that which the Protestants of Ireland have exercised against the Catholics. Did we tell them we've conquered them? It would be above board. But to punish them by confiscation and other penalties was monstrous injustice. This was the approach taken by the great historian Lecky in his 18th century history, and revisionism has not altered the judgment much. But the penal laws are important because there is, I think, an intimate and complicated relationship between religious history and the history of hatred in Ireland as elsewhere. Historians have generally fought shy of this rather unpalatable subject, with a couple of notable exceptions, but some of the best work on the history of religious hatred in Irish history is written by journalists like Marcus Tanner rather than by historians. There seems to be, I think, a relationship to a history of contestation for land or for power in the parts of the country where violent hatreds were most obviously enacted. And that is not only applicable to Ulster, though Guy's work means that's now the area where we see it most intensely demonstrated. And what seems undeniable is that um, complex as Irish ancien regime society was, it left behind a rationale by which future violent antipathies could be excused. And the history, Musgrave's history of the rebellion, which Guy often refers to, is a vital player in this. Just as interesting, and arguably just as significant, is the way that historic social and political resentments and antipathies were negotiated after the social and political discriminations against the Catholic majority had been removed and the Catholic bourgeoisie began to enter its kingdom and its social advancement. In the more relaxed and prosperous days of what might be called Edwardian Ireland, the early 1900s, before the revolution, there seems to have been an expectation that those old hatreds were moderated. Old injustices were fading into a kind of accepting forgetfulness. A new class was in the ascendant. This was the widely held expectation, but the expectation was not borne out. There was a revolution against the Ancien Regime. And tracing the fault lines and currents in that pre-revolutionary period indicate that change was on the way. How you trace the way these underground hatreds operate and resurface is difficult and it's often illuminating to look at literary culture as Peter has just looked at Milos. And certainly a recognition of Irish antagonisms fuels the work of W.B. Yeats as it would later that of Seamus Heaney. It chimed with Yeats's politics and his preoccupation with pre-Christian Ireland when he wrote, the ancient Irish did not weigh and measure their hatred but focused it into a pure idea, 
And from this idealism came a certain power of saying and forgetting things, especially a power of saying and forgetting things in politics which others do not say or forget. Throughout his life he agonized about the ambivalence of feeling which were in, was inseparable from being an Irishman with a Protestant inheritance and a life partly lived in England steeped in English literary culture. He said the Irish have preserved their ancient deposit through wars of the 16th and 17th century and no people hate as we do in whom that past is always alive. There are moments when hatred poisons my life and I accuse myself of effeminacy because I have not given it adequate expression. And then he realizes all he owes to English culture, I can't quote the whole passage, and ends, my hate tortures me with love, my love with hate. I am like the Tibetan monk who dreams at his initiation that he is eaten by a wild beast and learns on waking that he himself is eater and eaten. This is Irish hatred and solitude, the hatred of human life that made Swift write Gulliver and the epitaph upon his tomb that can still make us wag between extremes and doubt our sanity. Had I time, I could go on and talk a great deal more about how Yeats negotiates historical hatred and forgetting in his work, notably in his poem Easter 1916 with the great image of the stone in the stream, perhaps above all in his poems written during the Irish Civil War, Meditations in Time of Civil War, where he invokes a stable past and present, but what lies beneath it in ancestral houses. The idea that the achievements of civilization often derive from the violence of conquest and dispossession, and rather more worryingly that the energy of that violence is dissipated when a society reaches a, a pitch of civilization and may have to be recovered and rediscovered. When this happens, when those energies are released once more into the maelstrom of history is when um, the real problems occur and Yeats wrote his great poem 1919 about the Civil War which is beginning to inflame the countryside around Gort where he lived. Now these hatreds were perhaps so powerfully intense because they succeeded to and formed a mirror image of the brotherhood of the War of Independence. Unlike the nearly contemporary Spanish or Greek civil wars which saw long simmering political and social and class antagonisms burst into flame, the Irish Civil War pitted brother against brother. As subsequent events would show that vehemence would fracture into more and more violent antagonism and the force and fury of the Irish Civil War would entail on later generations a kind of duty of forgetting. How this came about remains to me at least obscure. The treaty debates in the Revolutionary Assembly, called Dáil Éireann, suggest a degree of underlying resentment between certain leaders, as do other sources. The young and ambitious, as in any revolution, were implicitly in contest with each other for the levers of power, though this was obscured by the rhetoric of fraternity and, above all, by the easy identification of a common enemy. The fact that this common enemy was the moderate nationalist Irish Parliamentary Party who are fellow Irishmen and usually fellow Catholics, even more than it was the British Army or the RIC, is often uncomfortably clear. The polemic of the revolutionary ideologue Patrick Pearce called for a recognition of this necessary hatred against those who had, as he saw it, collaborated in the easy evasions of history. He said, he denied that a gospel of hate is barren. He said, a nation must feed itself on hate and um, in the end of this extraordinary um, piece of writing, The Sovereign People, he says, Love and hate are not mutually antagonistic but mutually complementary. Love connotes hate, hate of the thing that denies or destroys or threatens. Hate is not only a good thing but a duty. Written in 1915, this in some ways reflects the fevered feelings released by World War I, but it also strikes a jarring note in what I've described as the Edward Edwardian Ireland and its polite collusions. Having worked on the pre-revolutionary era for some time, I have tried to trace the way that rhetoric changes in these years and the confrontational, uncompromising and often explicitly violent rhetoric takes over from the more idealistic um, manifestos of the earlier period. 
It often goes with a vein of anti-Semitism, which reminds us of similar themes in Austria and Hungary during these years. But it also goes with a recharging of historical memory. It's no coincidence that, as Guy mentioned in his introduction, the centenary of the 1798 rising, 1898, is a key moment when the memory of that violent moment of resistance is focused. In a rather selective version of joint Protestant-Catholic effort to overthrow the Saxon invader, past history parlayed into present purposes yet again. Less obviously, this also seems to me a moment when a distinct sense of generational change is present and articulated. And it's relevant to our subject today that the concept of a generation in history, pioneered by Ortega y Gasset and Karl Mannheim in the early 20th century, is also used powerfully by Pierre Norach, the doyen of memory studies. If I may quote Guy in his new book, generation has two meanings. It is both a collective of people for whom the revolution was a memorable event, and also the act of generating through which the memory of the rebellion is given meaning. The concept of generation is central to understanding memory, and Pierre Nora even defined it as a lieu de mémoire. It is also a lieu d'oubli. The memories transmitted by those who had witnessed 1798 were shaped through practices of concealment and were replete with hesitation, so that unwittingly the generation of the turnout, the revolution, the rebellion, also bequeathed traditions of forgetting to future generations. And this is all the more true of those who witnessed the revolution of 1912-22 and particularly the Civil War, which dictated the need to forget. Families were divided. I was told by one member of the old revolutionary elite, then aged in her 90s, that though her parents, aunts and uncles had taken different sides in 1922-3 and often no longer spoke to each other, their children, who were her generation, were sent on holiday with their cousins, and discussion of past politics was forbidden. So much so that my interlocutor had grown up ignorant of the part that her, her own mother had played in the revolution. This was the generation of forgetting, in Guy's phrase, but it followed an era when a specific appeal had been made by the new revolutionary generation to extremis, extremism, to hatred of compromise, to écraser l'infâme. When Yeats's muse Maud Gone was received into the Catholic Church in 1903, she rather surprised the priest who was doing the operation by insisting on including a ritual of hatred for England. I renounced the British Empire, which I looked on as the outward symbol of Satan in the world. At another level, a young revolutionary, Mabel Fitzgerald, a friend of Bernard Shaw's, wrote to him in 1914 she was bringing up her children and her young son in the sound traditional hatred of England and all her ways. Shaw replied, Dear Mabel, as an Ulster woman you must be aware if you bring up your son to hate anybody except a papist you will go to hell. You must be a wicked devil to lead a child's innocent soul with a load a child's innocent soul with a burden of hatreds and rancors that Ireland is sick of. But in fact Mabel was nearer the mark than GBS. Perhaps what neither of them anticipated was the extent to which the emotion of hatred would flare up between Irish people rather than being directed simply towards the ancient oppressor who sometimes stood in as a lightning rod for um, these intracommunal hatreds. It's more comprehensible if we look at the progress of the Irish Revolution itself because I think there's a shift around 1918 to 19 when a new generation, so to speak, certainly a new intellectual generation, sees the initiative from the radical theorists, the cultural revolutionaries, the feminists, and there's an older rhetoric of faith and fatherland which takes over. The revolution is subsequently <coughs> Catholicized, where the martyrs of 1916 are turned into saints who have died for the redemption of mankind, following Pierce's model. But this hadn't been the objective of all the original revolutionaries who were in some cases a great deal more hard-headed and secular-minded than the company of saints. One of them remembered sadly what fun they had had in their revolutionary youth. Their successors, one might say, took the fun out of fundamentalism. Fun, not to mention secularism, was at a discount in the transfigured state of existence after 1916 and perhaps particularly after 1921. There had been an upheaval in hearts and minds, which characterizes Europe 
before 1914, one of those generational shifts of tempo which happens in France in the 1780s or America in the 1960s, when a generation repudiates the acceptance world of their parents. And one of the striking ways in which Ireland, the history of Ireland 100 years ago, has been opened out and reconceived is by seeing it as closer to the histories of Central and Eastern Europe in those post-World War I years than is often realised. I remember, I remember so often these days, John Stuart Mill's remark that Ireland is in the mainstream of European experience while England is in an eccentric tributary of its own. Historians of Europe have illuminated the way that Central and Eastern Europe continued the First World War with shifts of borders, intercommunal conflict, paramilitary banding and all the rest and looked like in, in this context Ireland at the time of the 1919 to 21 war and the Civil War is very similar. The difference is that apart from some isolated horrific episodes, Ireland did not see the concentration of intercommunal killings which were seen in Central and Eastern Europe. And that's partly to do, I think, with the seismic aftershock of the dislocation of the Austro-Hungarian, Russian and Ottoman empires compared to the waning empire of Britain. There are also, and I can't go into them now, infrastructural reasons why communities, divided communities managed to live together in, say, Ulster, where they did not in Silesia. Certainly after the revolution, though violence and intimidation continued in some localities, the removal of six northeastern counties enabled a stable and homogenous state to evolve in the rest of the island. It's been suggested that if partition hadn't happened, and if those awkward six northeastern counties with their big Protestant and Unionist majority hadn't been taken out, that Ireland in the 20s would have split apart as viciously as the Balkans did in the 1990s. That may be too pessimistic. What's certainly true is that what made Ireland's path to a certain extent sui generis was partly the power of the Catholic Church and the almost monolithic religious composition of the populace. But there, were also, there was also the implicit continuity of themes and forms of government inherited from the years of British rule. A two-party democratic bicameral parliamentary system, a powerful and independent civil service, and so on. But this was something that had to be strategically forgotten in favour of a more Manichaean version of history. During the high point of commemoration in 2016, I spoke to an Irish audience in Camden Town, an Irish um, um, expatriate audience, and was asked why, despite the extent of violence in the Anglo-Irish and civil wars, such a stable state emerged afterwards. My answer was for the same reason that the revolution succeeded in the first place, which was that the revolutionaries had the good fortune to be rebelling against a liberal democratic state, unlike those dissolving empires elsewhere in Europe. One outcome was the British government's enforced responsiveness to domestic public opinion, which pushed Lloyd George to terms. It's also true that this stability emerged from the fact that the new state mimicked so many of the legal, political and cultural forms of the British government ethos. This was not an entirely welcome reflection to my audience in Camden Town, um, especially when I added that in Edwardian Ireland the obvious forms of oppression by England were in the past, while condescension and various forms of exclusion continued. The processes of state-aided land ownership, taxation reform, local government reform, old age pensions, and all the rest, were creating in Ireland a materialist Anglophone world against which the idealistic revolutionaries rebelled. One of my audience members said that, in his opinion, the reason for all of Ireland's post-revolutionary problems was that the country hadn't adopted a truly Gaelic form of government. I don't know whether this meant reverting to the pre-medieval Brehan laws or the institution of high kingship, but it does raise a question of what's been called the Gaelic Enlightenment, the Gaelic Romantic versus the Irish Enlightenment tropes, which were argued out in the aftermath of revolution. The essential point I want to make here was that the factors that made Ireland a successful post-revolutionary state could not be openly acknowledged and conservative Irish administrations operated within strict and coded parameters. Strategic forgetfulness was mobilized and a very careful negotiation of official memory. The question of commemoration comes sharply into focus from early on 
furiously reacted to by old revolutionaries by, or their relics who feel sidelined, while the government, especially the Fianna Fáil government in the 30s, takes it over. Those in power used commemorative activities to stress militarism, conveying the message of independent power. But there were less obvious demonstrations at work too, and much work has been done on the way that 1916 was approached in 1966, as opposed to the 75th anniversary when events in Northern Ireland in 91 made it necessary to move very gingerly indeed. I can't at the moment speak, though I would like to, about the influence of what happened in Northern Ireland on how the Irish past in the Republic was re-envisioned, in, especially in academic historiography. It's an important and enormous subject and it is there to be remembered. Another strong influence was a shift in Irish cultural attitudes among the young from the 60s and 70s away from the obediently religious cast of mind and the, uh, I think the advent of radical feminism in the early 70s. So there is a sense in which Irish historians have advanced in gingerly fashion towards a common ground where, as Peter was calling for, nuances explored and sheep and goats are allowed mingle together. The recent commemorations have allowed and enabled this and those of us who are sceptical whether the government committee in charge of them could do this have had to admit that they have. They have allowed the realisation that there were other narratives and other identifications subscribed to in Ireland a hundred years ago. We've also learned something from other commemorative jamborees in Ireland such as the 150th anniversary of the onset of the Great Famine in 1995 where many strange generalisations about psychotherapy, trauma, survivor guilt and collective memory were made. 1798 and its bicentenary Guy has mentioned and indeed written about and that too made certain uh, claims that were too present minded for some of us who have a stricter historical analysis. But it does seem to me the commemoration of the commemorative organizations attending to 1916 in 2016 avoided these dangers. And a new generation of historians has begun to examine the effect of violence and hatred on local communities. A key effect of forgetting involves smoothing out awkward, ambiguous, iconoclastic elements and prioritizing the pietistic and feel-good side. The government committee in charge of the recent commemorations were laudably conscious of this and duly criticized in some quarters for those who wanted a more straightforward celebration. Nor can we ignore the fact that there are peace walls in the north and ghost estates in the south and a contested history of religious demography all over the island of Ireland. They stem from our history too. Finally, in conclusion, we should be wary about reading history the way we wish it had happened. The Irish Revolution should be seen as the result of long-term historical antagonisms working below the surface, as well as an extraordinary combination of circumstances and gifted actors. Bringing to attention what divided Irish people in the past as well as what united them and facing up to uncomfortable truths also involves facing up to how strategic our mechanisms of oblivion as well as of memory remain in that attempt to negotiate the aftermath of hatred. Finally, the third part of my title, The Random Bullet. Guy's book, which is an exercise in vernacular historiography as well as much else, reverts on several occasions to grandfather stories. And regarding the Irish Revolution of 1912 to 22, I have my own. It might also illustrate Guy's concept of imagined reminiscence. My maternal grandfather, Thomas Fitzroy, died in 1923, aged 54, leaving a large family. He was an officer in the RIC, the Royal Irish Constabulary, stationed in Wicklow Town. My mother, who was aged five at the time of his death, she was born in 1918, grew up with the following account from her widowed mother. Her father, the late RIC man, had been an immensely popular and convivial figure in Wicklow Town. His house in Church Street was the centre of many merry gatherings from, by all sorts of people, and his death was an unfortunate accident. During the Anglo-Irish War, he was in the company of a deeply unpopular senior officer of the RIC when an IRA sniper shot at the inspector, missed him, and got my grandfather instead. My grandfather did not die immediately, 
but three years later from the after effects of the bullet which remained lodged in his body and as my mother used to put it from her own mother it moved around his body until it eventually reached his heart. This meant that the pension was much less than it should have been. My resourceful grandmother converted their sizable house into a lodging house and was herself a much loved Wicklow character living on into the 1950s. But as she always told her children, their father had been immensely well liked and the IRA sent someone to the house to apologize for having shot him by mistake. I grew up with this story and believed it implicitly until I went to the USA and met a cousin who had done research into the family background. She laughed heartily at my version and told me it was nonsense. Our grandfather, who was famously convivial, as I've said, died of cirrhosis of the liver. Maybe I will find corroboration of the story of the mistaken pot shot and even of the IRA's apology, but it hasn't emerged yet. What interests me now, especially after reading Guy, is the version that was handed down and the reasons for it, particularly as it reflects my grandmother's situation, a Protestant policeman's widow trying to make her way as a lodging house landlady in newly independent Ireland, scarred by revolution and civil war. The story of that random bullet making its way through a popular policeman's doomed body was a potent metaphor. Given her circumstances, elective amnesia and creative invention must indeed have been necessary for a viable future. And on a much larger level, they still are. Thank you. students have to rush to, to other classes because I, I can see that but actually I'm quite overwhelmed by, by that last particular story at the end uh, we were going to say that we will adjourn and go to the pub to continue the discussion there but actually I'm going to push it a bit and say that I will take some questions uh, let the people have to rush go I'll wait for a minute for people to come to clear the hall I have to rush to the next appointment and we'll stay for another five minutes of questions if people have burning questions but I'll accept it in a minute Please. My name is Mario Kalmi, and I want uh, to ask a question in relation uh, uh, to second uh, lecture. I want to ask you a question. Very maybe this good uh, in a uh, part of uh, cases uh, 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 to forget and uh, to unremember. Uh, uh, different uh, historical uh, uh, processes uh, from the past uh, uh, because uh, according uh, uh, to case uh, of a uh, situation uh, in England uh, and uh, in uh, Oxford uh, in uh, North England uh, we are can uh, to see uh, that uh, a phenomenon of uh, 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 of uh, in different uh, uh, moments uh, of uh, human evolution, uh, uh, different moments uh, uh, of uh, struggle uh, for uh, independence uh, of uh, all the area, uh, all this uh, opened uh, a way to negotiations uh, and uh, uh, to possibility of uh, one uh, democratic uh, state. Uh, uh, for uh, to uh, Okay, so, so the question more specifically would be the kind of the transition. Yeah, yeah. Uh, to the I, I understand that it's for Professor Foster. We're going to try and focus the question. So the question is the transition from one democratic state to yeah, another. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, for my question. Yeah, but uh, okay, I, I might have missed a bit the, the focus, but the transition to the democratic and stable state. 
stable state after the revolution. The, in fact, it's my belief that the treaty that allowed the setting up of the Irish Free State, partitioned Irish Free State, was only possible because the year before there had been the Government of Ireland Act which made us independent in a very regrettable way, not independent, but made it separate as part of the United Kingdom, in a very regrettable way, as we know it. also has Central European connotations. You can go to Hungary nowadays and people will constantly talk about how Hungary, uh, the Hungary was divided, but they forget the fact that they didn't end up as, as Yugoslavia as well. We forget that sometimes these excisions have a long-term benefit which people don't want to remember. Is there another question? We have time for one more, I believe. Please, Fran. Hi, I'm Fran Markowitz and I have written about ex-Yugoslavia. I'm a cultural anthropologist and I'm sort of sitting in awe after these two amazing talks. One was just so magisterial, jumping throughout the centuries and sending all of these names our way. And the second was such a, a, a beautiful uh, a, a, um, and, and, and almost tear-inducing <laughs> analysis of the juxtaposition, complementarity of, of love and hate. So my, my question, I'd like to follow up on Mr. Yerushalmi's question because I'm looking at the, if you will, constant um, um, thorn in the side of these fragmentations. Uh, a guy is talking about um, the blocking, you know, the, the, the removal of certain pieces of Hungary and given to Romania and so on and so forth. And of course, in Hungarian rituals, you can see these maps that show um, uh, the blank spaces and kind of, um, sometimes they have, you know, blood um, um, the symbols of blood of where these pieces of the map were forcibly removed from others in former Yugoslavia and particularly in, in, in um, Bosnia-Herzegovina the fact of partitioning is um, constantly re-remembered as painful as externally imposed and the minority populations are a living thorn in the side to the majority populations. So what, what, what I'm taking away from both of your talks is that this kind of friction between um, remembrance and forgetting um, boils over. You know, in, in times when we remember too much, um, other people come along in the, in the in the cover of the night and they steal the counter uh, monuments that are placed next to the real monuments. I just saw some of this in Serbia last year when I was there literally a year ago. Or in, in, in Bosnia, you know, they, the, particularly in Mostar, there's this one school building and two school days where the Croatian students study one thing and and the Muslim or Bosniak students study another thing, even though they're studying the same thing, but at different perspectives. And I, I just kind of sit here and look at this battle of remembrance, is that the right word? Battle or conflict or friction, remembrance and, and forgetting. And I loved um, uh, both of you kind of 
talked about this undercurrent when you when you forget like you're trying to forget but it almost like rumbles underneath the earth's surface and says remember me remember me remember remember today the third of december <laughs> guys cute little uh, uh, motto for this conference i guess uh, i i don't really have a question i just really have a reaction a very uh, um, deep emotional and intellectual reaction to the two uh, provocative talks that you gave, and I, you know, I just wonder if you have some kind of follow-up comments about this friction. Juxtaposition is so much of a prettier word, I guess maybe because it comes from Latin and friction is, you know, more Germanic. I, I just wonder, you know, if sitting here in Beersheba in Israel with Hebron down the road and uh, you know if, if, if you I'm talking from the Eastern European ex-Yugoslav perspective if maybe being here in Israel slash Palestine um, um, makes you rethink some of the words that you graced us with earlier today thank you so, so Fran has invited each of the speakers if I understand correctly to add a concluding comment an update, if they wish, or revise their own papers which they prepared in advance based on their impressions upon landing in Israel of, of today, 2018. Not an easy task. You, Peter, you, would you, you like to add a comment? No, I didn't hear it very well. So well, well, summarize it well, 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 in general, in, in general it would be, we, we heard here strong impressions from both papers, but do you have any update for your paper based on your impressions coming to Israel? Would you see any of all of these coming out with Israel of today? Is there any comment you would like to add to your paper based on the current stasis of where you see Israel at the moment? Haven't had time to take it in really. All right. It is overwhelming. <laughs> Professor Foster. The question or the comment was so eloquent itself that I'm reluctant to add to it. We're both burking it a bit here. But um, I, it's the first time I've been in Israel, but through knowing Guy and through reading a little history, parallels have often occurred to me. And it is this negotiation of a past which involves a necessary amount of forgetting and self-invention in a new country, which makes the parallels between Ireland and Israel so interesting to me and I know to Guy as well. In terms of repressing the memory, I think that is the danger. I think we mustn't repress memory. I think one has to negotiate it. And that doesn't necessarily mean forcible forgetting. But there's got to be a sense in which you, you know the phrase forgive and forget. I think forgive and remember is probably more commensurate with how human beings' psyches actually operate, uh, though it's, as they say, a big ask. And, and I thank Professor Foster for not spelling it out that directly. We could look, we can all think about parallels of laws of forgetting being passed in this country and laws of loyalty, but that wouldn't be, that would be, I think, too direct. I think the wonderful thing of papers like today is they encourage us each to think our own, to work it out for ourselves where we see the parallels, each to use our own work of interpretation. There's no one answer for this, but it's to take this material and to see how we interpret our own world and our own struggles of forgetting and remembering. And I think it's very relevant if we put them together. I'm going to invite Tal to conclude. Thank you, Guy, and I would like to thank our speakers once again. Thank you very much. I would like to invite all of you to join us for an Irish celebration and a Hanukkah candle lighting at the Benji pub right after this. Um, and to thank one more time to Ambassador Kelly and um, to Guinness for supporting this event. So thank you very, very much. Um, on your way out, you will have a special opportunity uh, to purchase Guy, Professor Beiner's um, new book, um, Forgetful Remembrance. Um, this is really a special opportunity, so I invite you all to enjoy it. Um, and thank you all for coming. Please follow uh, our representatives the w uh, all the way to the Benji par bar. Thank you very much. Thank you.